is you're trying to create a culture of uh, courage and uh, and true change, you got to be focusing on the force and getting the right people and the right stakeholders in the room and being honest with one another. Okay, welcome back to the podcast. It is an honor to welcome Chris Volk onto the show. Chris has been a leader in the real estate mortgage and lease solutions for 30 years. He's taken three companies public on the NYSE. He was the founder of Store Capital. He's the author of the book, The Value Equation, which we're going to talk about now. Um, he's also a board member on many companies, including one called Armada ETFs, so that if you're a listener, you hopefully know who they are. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to say on a personal level, Chris, it has been a joy working together um, at Armada. And I want to thank you for the guidance that you've provided, which has been really invaluable. So, so thank you for that. And it's an honor to talk to you on the podcast. Well, it's been fun being a part of Armada, and it's good to see you here on the podcast too, Phil. All right, let's start with the book, The Value Equation. So this book is full of incredible advice for entrepreneurs and also for investors, depending on how you're looking at value creation and equity uh, equity creation, depending on what side you're on. But it's really applicable to both ends. And you know what's really amazing in the book is you distill the secret of wealth creation down to a single formula. Um, what is it? What, what is that formula? Well, The Value Equation is a formula that's got six variables in it, um, and it's designed to give people an idea of what their current return on equity is. And that's basically the foundation behind all business wealth uh, that's that's created. And, you know, the, the the most wealthy people in the world and the biggest fortunes ever created were created doing business. And, uh, and the idea is to have a really strong business model. And uh, so we all want to serve customers. We all want to build businesses that address market needs. But if you can wrap that inside of a strong business model, which involves a certain amount of creativity, then you have a chance to really create some wealth and some, and some value, which you know not only goes into your pocket, but just improves every other stakeholder as well. And uh, uh, and so the value equation goes into the formula behind doing that and what the variables are. You talk a lot in the book about how um, the goal of, of an entrepreneur shouldn't be about, it shouldn't be about wanting to make money. You don't come at it with the goal of making money. You, you come at it with the goal of applying yourself to something that you're already good at, but doing it while retaining equity and leveraging other people's money. And you know, you kind of, you know, bring that into the formula. But you know, the start, the seed, the the, you know, the idea that people should chase is it's not about just, you know, trying to get rich because that could be futile if you're chasing money for the sake of money, versus, you know, using this this structure to do something that you already have an affinity for, you already have talent with. Um, was that idea, was that born out of your own experience? Yeah, I think so. I think I think entrepreneurs who are out there, most of us don't think about being billionaires or being multimillionaires. I mean, we'd like to make a million bucks, sure. We'd like to make more money than we'd be able to make with a regular paycheck. But um, most people... Um, are excited about just the opportunity to even get that done. Um, and they're not really, uh, you know, inherently targeted towards making money. That's not why they're doing it. They're doing it for the for the excitement and the joy of doing it and for taking, harnessing what you're really good at and creating a business with it. Um, and as long as you're doing that, then you want to wrap it again inside of a good business model uh, to, to make it the best it can be. You know, not all businesses are created equal. I mean, this is one of the things I learned very early in my career. Businesses are just different. Um, and uh, and the people that you see at the top of the Forbes 400 tend to have some of the best business models going. And not only that, but they own a big piece of them, which is which is also unusual. Um, uh, most of us will never be that, that, that fortunate or that lucky. And no, most of those people never thought they were going to get there. So, uh, so the idea is to do the best you can Focus on what your skills are and what you enjoy doing, um, and then get to work uh, on doing it. And and that's what I think entrepreneurs tend to do. The early stages of of a new venture is not about optimization or you know frameworks or, or you know how to um, how to manage the capital and the resources within an organization. It's really more about just finding that initial product market fit and start trying to build some momentum that you can capitalize on. Um, you know, down the road. I mean, I mean, how you know how different is it the early stages versus the process of managing and optimizing a mature business? Yeah, well, in the early stages, you're just trying to 
identify a need and then figure out how you can address it. I mean, all companies solve problems and uh, and some of the biggest and most powerful companies that solve big problems that also oftentimes tend to be global. Um, uh, but fundamentally, all of us solve problems. And so one of the things that's exciting about running a business is being able to address a need, to solve a problem for people. Because if you solve a problem for somebody, you're valuable, uh, you're you're adding value to somebody. Uh, and then as you're as you're solving the problem, what you want to do is get you know a group of people together that probably have disparate still skill sets, and you're focusing on how do I solve this problem in the most efficient way possible, so I can create a, a decent business model, so this thing can have some legs and and create value for all those people who work really hard to create it. And uh, uh, and so that's what you're doing in the beginning. Later on, as as a company gets mature, now. You know, you you end up with competitive pressures. You end up with changing market dynamics, uh, uh, and, and so you're there always trying to refine the business model and and getting people together and 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 address those uh, business model issues. And this is not easy for companies to do because a lot of times the bigger a company gets, the more silos you get. You know, the more bureaucracy that happens in a company, and all the biggest problems, unfortunately, require the entire group of people across silos. To get together and solve the the biggest problems that are out there, and so uh, uh, so I think sometimes with the, with large companies that are uh, seasoned and entrenched in their business, uh, they can have hard times uh, um, being able to refine their business model just because they become unwieldy. It it, it all kind of you know comes back to this concept that you wrote about the circle of business life, and I love this quote that you put in there um, uh, from Ben Franklin. He said, "When you've finished changing, you're finished." Right, you know, constantly Absolutely. always be evolving. Um, but but tell me about the circle of business life. Yeah, well, there are um, uh, for sure circles of business life. So uh, and and sometimes people can overcome them and and uh, and really change their business model radically. And sometimes they can't. So, uh, for example, when Netflix first came out, it was a company that was providing DVDs by mail uh, to people. So. You or I would sit at home. We decide we want to watch a movie. Uh, we would uh, uh, join Netflix. We we would pay a subscription fee. We would fill a list of the movies we wanted to go see, and they would just send us uh, DVDs, and we'd watch them and then mail them back to them. Um, but as streaming became available, that business model became untenable. I mean, it was not something that was going to last. So fundamentally, Netflix had to change their business model radically. Uh, at the same time as this was happening, uh, another competitor, which is uh, Blockbuster Video, um, saw the same thing happening. Uh, but Blockbuster had a bigger problem. They had lots of storefronts, whereas Netflix didn't have the storefronts. And not only that, they had franchisees. Netflix didn't have any franchisees either. And so uh, as they were looking to also get into the streaming business, it was going to put their storefronts and their franchisee system out of business. And uh, ultimately, uh, a lot of shareholders pressed them not to make the changes, and they were bankrupt and out of business in years. Uh, so the circle of life, you know, killed one company, whereas Netflix was able to uh, resolve its issues and actually change its business model in a very major way. Um, in the book, one of the things I, I talked about towards the end was uh, Amazon and Sears Roebuck, and I just liked it because. Uh, Sears Roebuck uh, came into being in the late 19th century. It was the first company that came in with a catalog. And for those of you old enough to remember the Sears catalog, it was about this thick uh, with with about everything imaginable. I mean, at some points you could you could have bought a house from from Sears. And uh, and Sears was dependent upon uh, all these stores and delivering by rail. Uh, so the railroads were fairly new in America at the time. Um, and uh, and they became successful, and they became a huge disruptor, and uh, shortly became the the largest uh, uh, retailer in the country, and the first retailer to be uh, in the Dow Jones Industrials on the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, and then at some point in time, the 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 world caught up with them. They became big. They became unwieldy. Uh, uh, online shopping started to be just very nascent, but. Uh, Sears decided to get rid of its catalog, and they did it probably two years before Amazon came online with effectively a catalog, but it was an online catalog. So in a way, there was 
there's sort of a continuity with the disruption between Sears and, and Amazon, only Sears completely uh, uh, went away or became uh, far less relevant. And then Amazon became the force it is today. So there's uh, one company that was unable to, uh, it was a disruptor in the 19th century, early 20th century, uh, unable to keep that uh, disruptive force. And then you had uh, Jeff Bezos and his group that were able to do so. Your career has been spent primarily in with REITs and real estate, real estate financing. Have you seen any of those cycles play out in the REIT space? Or do you anticipate anything playing out that way in the future? It's been way less so. I mean, REITs are um, they're asset-based companies and they're uh and 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 they tend to have very low levels of debt against the assets. And so the question is, are the assets going to be relevant? Are they going to stay relevant for a long period of time? Um, what we're seeing today is there are certain sectors like office, for example, which is going through uh, a lot of uh, disruption malls, going through some disruption where the valuations have been um, uh, substantially impacted uh, by changes in either work for home, home or different shopping um, uh, habits that people have. And uh, but I expect that those companies will resolve this, but the but the values may not come back to to where they were. Um, as a person who's started a couple of these companies and a couple of real estate investment trusts and, and uh, led three of them, I would say that I would think about things over the long term that you knew were coming. So, uh, for example, today the uh, one of the big uh, trends is going to be electric cars, and and there's just a big push on electric cars all over the country. Um, and that is going to have a, a big impact on on sort of uh, vehicle infrastructure and on convenience stores and w- what kinds of services are needed for those kinds of vehicles. Uh, as we get into driverless cars, and my son just went home from a basketball game in Arizona in a driverless Waymo car uh, that he said was uh, flawless. I mean, uh, if, as you get into uh, driverless vehicles, that's going to just change real estate in a very, very big way from parking needs to um, uh, to to the kinds of real estate that you you want to access. So um, you it, it really pays to sort of try to think ahead for these things. Yeah, 100 um, percent. Bit of a loaded question here, but you you mentioned how office REIT valuations have been dropping. Um, that might be true in the public sphere, but we haven't really seen it in the private sphere. Um, is that is that sustainable? Is that is that is there you know a valid reason for that? What, what what do you make of that? We started off in our business career running uh, private real estate uh, for a number of years, and then uh, eventually listed a lot of those properties on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, the first company we took public was in 1994, but the assets we took public uh, were all previously private assets that we merged together into a single company on the New York Stock Exchange. I tend to be a fan of public companies. Um, I think that the price discovery is just there. I mean, people know exactly what it's valued at. Um, uh, the idea of a decoupling of prices between private and public companies is just not something I feel personally comfortable with. Um, uh, so today you're seeing a situation where um, private real estate tends to have higher values than public real estate does. Um, uh, Over time, historically, what's what's tended to happen is that the public markets tend to get ahead of values, uh, whereas uh, private holders tend to be behind on values because values tend to be sticky in real estate. I mean, just think about owning a home. You're trying to buy a home uh, at a time where uh, prices are going down and you're and you're still adhering to the old prices you refuse to sell your house for a, for a cheaper price or you're trying to trying to keep uh, the value and you're talking yourself into the fact that your house is worth more um where conversely you're you're buying a house in a uh, market that's uh, rapidly rising and people are looking at all the old comps of cheap houses and you're trying to pay more for an expensive house and convince an appraiser that it's worth it uh well in the public markets you have none of that you've got price discovery every single day and and so I'm a fan of that. And this idea that the public markets overreact to me, it's a bunch of nonsense. If, if people truly, if people with capital truly felt that public markets overreact, which is you know the people who are saying that are people with capital, with private capital, but plenty of access to capital, if they truly believe that they would start a hedge fund that would you know sell every up move and buy every down move and essentially build a mean reversion strategy as a high frequency trade. Uh, but they don't because obviously it's a bunch of nonsense, right? At any given moment, 
right? Price discovery means that's the price that someone's willing to buy at and someone's willing to sell at. It's not an appraisal. It's not an estimation. It's not based on comps. It's a real money. It's a real bid and it's a real offer that somebody somewhere is willing to put up cash to me. I mean, you can't get more valid than that. And, and, if, you, and if you think it's wrong, that's the beauty of it, right? You just trade against it. Public markets uh, right. over I mean, that. Right. I was talking to an analyst years ago who did a, a research piece that was terrific. And it was a piece that basically said that if you had bought assets that were trading at a discount to reported net asset value, uh, and that was your strategy. So I'm going to buy the cheap assets. I'm going to sell the assets that are highly valued relative to net asset value. Um, and, and the question is, with public read stocks, is that a good strategy? I mean, is it a good thing to do is sit there and look at the NAV of a, of a company? And if it's got a price that's a low price to NAV, just buy it. Uh, if you have a, a read that looks pretty expensive, fully priced out relative to its NAV, sell it. Um, and it turns out that's a, just a bad strategy. It doesn't work today. I mean, uh, and I think that the reason it doesn't work is it's because the price to NAV analysis has no bearing on business models. And of course, you know, I wrote the book, The Value Equation, which is centered on business models because I think they're important. And when I ran a real estate investment trust personally, I focused very heavily on the business model. And I think that people who are buying stocks do care about the cash flow per share. They care about what the cash flow per share is going to do rising up over time. And they care about that much more than they care about what somebody is going to report to be uh, NAV. And of course, if you're looking outside of REIT stocks, nobody asks you what the NAV of IBM or Coca-Cola is. It's just somehow with REIT stocks, I think sometimes people leave their brains at the door and they think that the NAV is somehow this overriding, compelling, important thing that they really have to know all the time. Yeah, it's, it's like I, I always found it hysterical in the NFL when there's a play, you know, the ref takes the ball, just puts it down in some spot somewhere around where the guy was tackled, not but not, with no precision. And then... They take out the chains, right? And they go to the, you know, hundredth of a, of a centimeter, like, you know, did the ball cross the exact 10 yard difference in the chains? But the starting point was just some arbitrary point. And that's what it feels like. It's like, all right, let's call it a premium or discount to NAV, but what is NAV, right? Who's coming up with NAV and how? How precise is that? It's like, you know, how, how well, do you- I can, I can tell you how precise it is. So um, when we sold it, we sold our first company uh, to uh, GE Capital, uh, and that was done in 2001. And then seven years later, six years later, we sold our second company to a private um, asset management firm. And in one case, uh, they're both doing purchase accounting. So when you buy a company, you've got to actually reappraise all the assets you're buying because you allocate your purchase price based upon appraised value. So in the in in one case in the in GE's case uh they wanted the assets appraised super low i mean they wanted them as low as they could possibly get them um they had reasons for this um and in the second case the uh investor wanted the assets appraised as high as they could get them uh and so i gave instructions to the valuation company that we'd engage to be very conservative uh in the case of the 2001 purchase be very uh you know, aggressive on the 2007 purchase, um, which they did. Um, and uh, and in the case of uh, 2001, we had a very low valuation. 2007, the valuation was so high that there was almost no goodwill in the transaction. It was almost just, you know, pure NAV uh, purchase. Um, and uh, and the odd thing was that the, the valuation firm we hired was the same valuation firm in both cases. So it, it shows you that that appraisers can rationally come up with very, very different appraisal numbers based upon certain assumptions that you give them. I mean, uh, uh, based upon uh, uh, certain market assumptions, there's a huge delta. Um, and I think investors should be very uncomfortable with that process, uh, which means that they should they should look at the NAV that's reported by people or estimated by people. They should look at it with a grain of salt. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't really mean that much. And they should be really focusing on you know, guess what? Dividends, cash flow per share, cash flow growth, things that are fundamental to every other asset that they own. There's also a tremendous lag involved. So when the market, you know, turns from, you know, one one trajectory to another very quickly, which by the way, happened last year in 2022, the appraisals are going to be very slow to catch up, right? As they're done property by property over the course of a year, whereas the mark to market stuff that will reflect the new economic reality as it changes. Sometimes it changes fast, 
And that's okay, but but that will be reflected. And you know, again, you don't like the price, just hit the bid. Hit the right. bid. And, and the other thing is that sometimes the appraisals can be done differently. So uh, in some cases, your appraisers uh, can be looking at comparable assets, um, which is probably the best way to go. Um, but then in some cases, they could be looking at uh, a discounted cash flow analysis, which is coming up with a, a much different valuation. And it's going to have a lot less volatility than, let's say, looking at comparable asset sales. So when it comes to real estate, uh, the devil and it can be in the details in terms of how NAV is arrived at. I wanted to ask you about Warren Buffett. Um, Warren Buffett through Berkshire Hathaway invested mm -hmm. $377 million into store capital. How did all that come together? So in uh, store capital, we started in 2011 and we took it public in 2014 and it stayed public till the beginning of this year when it was taken private and uh, the big investor in the privatization was the government uh, pension fund of Singapore. Um, but in 2014, I had an idea for how not to take store public. And it involved uh, aligning store with an insurance company. And I thought Berkshire Hathaway would be an interesting company to um, uh, work with. So I uh, looked for Warren Buffett's uh, email and I, I contacted uh, investment banking acquaintances and couldn't find a way to contact him. So I sent him an email to the just the basic uh, uh, central email box for Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, and and uh, Mr. Buffett responded uh, in oh, oh, hey, I got three hours. You know. uh, hang on. You sent an email to the general inbox of Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett himself responded. Yeah, Warren Buffett responded in three oh, hours. That's yeah. amazing. And, and so that was like on a Thursday. And so he asked for more uh, a more fleshed out proposal. So I worked very hard with uh, uh, the principal shareholders of the company to put together uh, a, a long email for him. Uh, those guys, by the way, were very amused that, that uh, Warren Buffett had responded so quickly. And and so um, and we sent him an email on Saturday. And at the time, I think Warren Buffett was ninety. You know, he was eighty five years old at the time. And so. We sent him the email on a, on a Saturday, and I was thinking I would hear back from him the following week or sometime when he could get around to it. And uh, that very day on Saturday, he responded uh, by email. So uh, for those people who think that uh, Warren Buffett's not computer literate or uh, uh, you know doesn't doesn't read his computer emails on a Saturday, uh, he does. <laughs> so um, and uh, he responded, introduced me to uh, folks inside of Berkshire. Um, Ultimately, they didn't do what I wanted them to do in 2014, but they uh, kept a relationship with us. So I knew them pretty well. And and, uh, uh, and our stock was doing fine. We took a public in 14. Uh, it was the best IPO of the year uh, in the REIT space. It uh, did fine in 15, did fine in 16, um, except at the end of 16, after the presidential election, a lot of REIT stocks started getting hit. And we, we got hit even worse in 17. And the stock went down substantially, and it was at that point that uh, I'm talking to Berkshire Hathaway, and uh, and you know what Berkshire Hathaway is always interested in is companies that have really solid business models that, for some reason or other, are, are trading at uh, prices that are disconnected with those business models, and this happens all the time. I mean, uh, uh, and uh, and that's what value investors do. And so uh, Berkshire Hathaway asked us if we would sell them 10% of the company, and um, we didn't need to sell them 10% of the company. We certainly didn't like the stock price, uh, but we did sell them 10% of the company because we now had you know, a good housekeeping seal of approval from one of the neatest shareholders in the world. And um, and you know the other shareholders, I'm sure, appreciated it because after uh, Berkshire bought the 10%, the stock immediately uh, began to escalate. And if you'd held onto the stock in 2017, you would have had double digit rates of return. Um, and uh, and that was all basically uh, uh, assured by having Berkshire Hathaway own as much as they did. And, and they they were a very good stockholder throughout my tenure. And um, I've been to their annual meetings and I'm a, I'm a big fan. That's great. I, I can't get over Warren Buffett responding to the email to the general inbox. Mm. I mean, that's just so fantastic. Um, and congratulations on securing that investment. Um, but, but, you know, look, when it comes to value investing, we're coming out of this environment, you know, particularly in, uh, you know, uh, I'd say 18 to 24 months post-COVID where 
there was a total disconnect between between intrinsic value and trading value, which is ironic, you know, given the conversation we just had about public versus non-trader REITs and mark to market, but still an environment where people are spending millions on metaverse real estate or, you know, the the board ape uh, JPEGs, right? And, and, you know, things that are, um, you know, even I would say the meme stocks, right? Disconnected from intrinsic value in a way you know, different than they were, you know, than, than the re people argue, like in a way that that's pretty, pretty clear uh, and, and and clearly unsustainable. But, you know, for value investing to work over the long term, there has to be some sort of mechanism, some sort of way that stock price and intrinsic value converge at some point, eventually, there has to be some sort of mechanism for that. And it feels a little bit like maybe that mechanism has been broken. You know, some people blame um, the passive flows and passive investing, probably a contributing factor. I don't know. Um, you know, has your faith in value investing shaken at all? And do you think that there is a disconnect between price and value? I think with public companies, they play by a different set of rules than private companies do. Um, uh, just the sheer liquidity that public companies have uh, just makes them behave a little bit differently, and uh, uh, and you can get what what uh, John Maynard Keynes used to call animal spirits that kind of arise and uh, and cause a lot of stuff to happen. Um, in the case of Store, um, my last company that I ran, we would look at our volume every day, and probably two thirds of the volume was just sort of day traders. I mean, I mean that's a significant amount of of capital. If you uh, when I was at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting last year, Warren Buffett gave a talk about how he acquired, uh, uh, I think at that time he had maybe 15% of Occidental Petroleum or 20% of Occidental Petroleum, uh, and and basically he acquired most of this over something like 14 days of trading, which would have almost seemed impossible. But the the volume was so high, and a lot of the volume was done by people that probably didn't even know what Occidental did for a living. I think, I think a lot of people who traded our stock didn't know what we did for a living. Um, uh, so there's there so there's a lot of uh, distractions when it comes to public companies uh, that uh, can cause their values to become decoupled from what they really their fundamentals really say they should be worth and um, and the value investor well so so I always think of it as sort of a double vortex or like a, uh, a double whirlpool where you have this whirlpool up top where you have these overly valued stocks and they're getting sucked down. Uh, as they get into sort of more reality. And the value guys are hanging around the hoop of the lower side where these undervalued stocks are there and they're getting sucked up. You know, so everybody's going to gravitate towards sea level, but but basically you you have all these forces that are going to shove these stocks in. But trying to bet on when that happens can be an interesting thing. I mean, it doesn't happen when people think it's going to happen. And so uh today, I mean, there you can, you know, people talk about meme stocks, uh uh you know, like GameStop or AMC, but I could say that, you know, you might have meme stocks even in uh, Amazon or uh, Tesla or other, you know, very large cap companies that have created substantial value. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree, at least about Tesla um, being a meme stock. Um, you know, I, it, it's been proven, it, very little discussion on it, but it's been proven that that Tesla in particular and a lot of the meme stocks and a lot of the stocks in general have been the the spot price of the stocks has been driven by options activity, um, and and the options market is getting you know now we've got these zero day options right, and I think a lot of the you know a lot of the um, what 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 you might consider you know more leaning more closely towards gamblers than investors, um, which you know not to say there's anything necessarily wrong with, but just to understand what's driving prices and and what the market is, a lot of those more gambling type activities happen in the options market. Now options are driving stock prices. And, you know, that's leading to a lot of disconnects and a lot of these issues. That was the case in Tesla. Um, that's been proven. And very few people want to talk about that. And, you know, it all kind of leads back to the capital markets being um, imperfect, right? Or, or different or changing, right? Uh, and, they are they are imperfect in so many ways. And I, I mean, I found this firsthand in my career. I mean, I saw where this happened with how our stock would get traded, but I saw it just even in the debt markets. I mean, uh, uh, and so this is the, this is part of the fun of uh, free enterprise, fun of capitalism is dealing with the imperfections. And um, uh, and uh, so I've I've enjoyed 
being in a, in a market that's got a lot of ambi- ambiguity into it. So, um, but I agree with you. Yeah. And you have to say also more opportunity, right? I mean, the more efficient yeah. the market is, there's no edge, right? So, you know, uh, the, right. Yeah. So, so, so I think, I think that does mean that there is a lot of opportunity now in the capital markets, in the REIT markets. Um, where, where do you see opportunity right now in the markets on a, on a forward looking basis? On a forward looking basis. Um, so me personally, I've been investing in, um, some in value stocks. I mean, I just tend to be a value investor. I mean, uh, Part of why I like value investing is I think you just you generally can't get hurt that bad. So if the market goes down, value stocks are going to get you know hurt less. So you have less downside capture. Your upside capture is almost at the market. So you basically have the upside, but you have to pan for gold to be able to do some of the value stock investing. Um, uh, you know, quite honestly, if you're putting a portfolio together today, you have to be really mindful of interest rates. I mean, uh, you're getting paid more to wait than ever, and uh, uh, I, you know, in my whole career, I started my work career in 1980. In 1981, Prime hit 21 percent, and, uh, and Volcker was doing uh, all the uh, monetary tightening <clears throat> and raising rates. And rates have been dropping basically my whole career. And so, you know, when that happens, a lot of people look really smart all the time because, uh, you, especially if you're buying assets or stocks, I mean, the, the assets start getting more and more valuable. Real estate becomes more and more valuable. You could refinance it at lower rates. You're buying companies in private equity. They become more valuable. You could refinance them at lower rates. Um, and now we're getting to a point now where we're really at an inflection point where rates are now going up. The 10-year tender, treasury t- seems to be sort of range, range bound around three and a half. But um, but it's sticking there, you know, and it may uh, head up a little bit. Who knows? But this is not unusual. And I think that uh, when people are thinking, well, rates are going to go back down for sure, uh, I wouldn't be so sure. I think that uh, today is a, a market that's a much better market for savers than ever before. Uh, and that uh, uh, savers are getting paid to put their money on the sidelines and not even invest in stocks. And so I have a lot of money that's just in, in cash and not invested at all. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole paradigm shift, and uh, mm-hmm. um, it, it will be will be certainly interesting to see. I, I, w- I want to pivot back to entrepreneurship for one thing. Um, there was another quote that you had in the book that I really loved. It said, "Strong, successful business cultures are those that never cease to make courageous decisions." Tell me more about that. Yeah, so if you're in a business, uh, you have to make some tough calls from time to time, and you have to be really honest with yourself. Uh, one of the things that I experienced uh, in my career was being part of a company where uh, positivity was a, just a feature. I mean, uh, so that uh, everybody wanted to be positive when they saw each other. You know, how you doing, Phil? I'm great. I mean, uh, if I were any better, it'd be illegal or something like that. So, um, so, so people were were encouraged to be super positive. Uh, being negative could be viewed as I'm just not a team player, um, and uh, uh, and so. So when you're when you're looking at creating a culture of performance, you can't have that. You have to be able to sit there and say, Phil, how you doing? And Phil, you're going to go, today's just not the best day. This is not working out and I got to figure this out. I mean, and it's it's OK uh, to, to be able to do that and to have a culture where you're able to speak out and say something's not working, focusing on getting stuff to be better all the time. Um, and and to have complete honesty and so have, and you have no thought police either i mean so i think all this stuff is very important the, the other thing is that oftentimes people would look at certain tools uh the tool could be something like uh six sigma or the uh or the uh, tool could be um management by objectives uh and these are all sort of management processes to to improve uh the way things work but both of these t- techniques involve putting people in the room that are the right people to be in the room, which means that they are uh, high enough up to be able to do something about it. They are from different sides of the business. Uh, They uh, all have a stake in what's being done. And the problems that you're solving have to be big enough to be worth it. And so what a lot of times happens is that people solve problems. They're small enough not to be worth it. They're inside of individual departments, so they're just all talking to to themselves, but they're missing 
uh, they're missing the, the the forest. I mean, they're focusing on on hugging trees, and they're missing the forest. And so, uh, as you're trying to create a culture of uh, courage and uh, and true change, you got to be focusing on the forest and getting the right people and the right stakeholders in the room and being honest with one another. I, I love that. That's great. That the problems have to be big enough that they're worth solving. I, I've I've found. You know, Armada is my my second asset management startup, and you know when I after the first one, I was reflecting on on my time and where you know where the time goes, like where where does our time go, right? And I was kind of looking back, and I felt like I had you know become susceptible to getting caught up in the emergency of the day. You know, there's always an emergency every day, right? There's emails right. popping, there's things going on, and I'm running around trying to solve things, and I felt like I didn't spend enough time being contemplative, trying to keep my eye on the big picture, thinking about, you know, the bigger trends and the bigger goals. And I've really been trying to solve for that. And in a zero sum, you know, world where there's only a certain amount of time that comes at a cost. And, and for me right now, it, it comes at a cost of maybe being as responsive as I'd like to be on my emails, right? Or, or certain things. You have to give something up to, to do better at something. But I've decided to, to make that trade where I'll be less you know, reactionary, less responsive, maybe less reactionary, but try to, to you know, try to keep that perspective. So it's really, um, really interesting to hear you articulate that because that's been on my mind lately. Well, Americans are the best and the worst. Uh, and one of our worst characteristics is that we, um, we assume that if we're really busy, we're productive and Americans love to be busy. So, um, and sometimes in, uh, as you're working, you're almost better off spending uh, 30 minutes a day on top of a blank sheet of paper with a with a pen, uh, thinking through things that you'd like to do and prioritizing your life. Um, and you'll save yourself just a lot of other problems if you if you can do that and make yourself more efficient. And uh, uh, so that's definitely something that I try to preach. Yeah, and that comes through uh, in the book as well. I'm going to hold up the book here. Uh, the value equate. Oh, I got the screen in the background. But um, but it's on Amazon. I highly highly recommend it. It's really it's a fantastic work. Um, Chris, thank you so much for coming on and uh, for telling your story. Um, where can people find you and read more of what you're working on? Yeah, so you can go to www.thevalueequation.com and you can uh, learn more about the value equation. You can also get um, I've, I've got some posters. I'll probably print some of those things up at some point in time. I've got lots of articles I've been writing over the last year. Um, and, uh, uh, and then if you, uh, 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 want to, want to find me, you can find me on LinkedIn. So I have a LinkedIn page, which is easy to spot. And, uh, otherwise, uh, you can call Phil because, because Phil knows exactly how to find me, but, uh, uh, yeah. So, so I'd be happy to hear from you. Well, well, thanks again. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you to the audience for your time and attention. And we'll be back on shortly. And Phil, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Phil Bach Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment to drop a review. This show was published for entertainment purposes only and is not investment advice. Please contact a licensed professional before making any investments. Some of the securities discussed on the show may be owned by its participants. Opinions expressed on the show may not reflect those of their employers. Stay hungry and stay foolish.